Last year, the team raised $140,000 for the walk to the Cape Islands. The total of Pittsburgh walk raised $515,000 for patient care um, in Western Pennsylvania. This year, we would absolutely love it if our corporate sponsors could bring that number up to $200,000. So we're shooting big, and we really hope that you'll help us out. You can ask anyone on our board, you can ask any of our patients, you can ask our donors. We are a very frugal bunch of people, hardworking, staff of six. One of them is missing from that picture. Um, we are small, but we are mighty. And <laughs> we care for over 300 people in 31 counties in western Pennsylvania. We have wonderful partners who help us, outstanding ALS clinics at AGH, up now, at Highmark, at now. I don't know, I'll have to go to the Alley, Highmark, whatever it is going to be, at AGH and in Johnstown. Um, by now, almost all of you know that ALS is a very horrible diagnosis. Um, there's no treatment, there's no cure, there's no positive outcome. The average lifespan after diagnosis is two to five years, and the military, for some unknown reason, are twice as likely to get ALS. Familial ALS accounts for 10% of all ALS patients, and the rest are called sporadic ALS, and nobody knows what causes it. There are many different types, um, but again, there's just no, no rhyme or reason, and um, we're all hoping and praying. Someday there will be treatment and a cure. For years, we've had the walk at the Pittsburgh Zoo. It was a great place to have a walk. It had built-in entertainment. It had penguins, it had polar bears, it had all kinds of fun things. But the walk grew and grew and grew, and we've outgrown the zoo. And we have changed the location to the point. We're actually getting to the point. We are moving to Point State Park, and we will have no limits in the number of people who can attend the walk. We will be showcasing our beautiful city, we will have a common gathering place to unite as an ALS community. Our hundreds of family and corporate sponsor teams will have their photos taken in front of the newly restored fountain. And it's really going to showcase our city. And following the walk, which is just going to go around the point itself, we will all end up back to Point State Park. And it will be an outdoor festival where we'll have entertainment things for children to do and a real celebration, um, memorial, and honoring people who we love and have lost uh, to ALS. And I thank you all for being here tonight because you're champions um, for this cause to defeat ALS. Um, I was diagnosed with ALS in March of 2004 and I was with one of the top neurologists in the country and it had taken me about a year and a half to get to that point where they said, you have ALS, Lou Gehrig's disease. And as the, um, the neurologist explaining um, what the disease is, what the progression is going to be, and um, it kept going on that it was going to rob a person of their ability to talk and walk. It might paralyze up to 400 muscles and that um, ALS is always fatal and it's a disease with not much hope. And I got hung up on there wasn't much hope. That part of it I couldn't accept and um, so that's when I began searching for hope. And I did, have, I did find hope in my faith and my family and my friends and the ALS Association. Now my progression of it, I have a slower progression and I'm grateful, but that gives me more than, uh, of a um, responsibilities to get, be involved in um, the research and getting out there and advocating and sharing my story. It's got to the, be the point where um, I can't use my hands at all. I'm just typing with one or two fingers, which drives the three teenagers uh, that I live with. My brothers can drive them crazy. So they take over after they watch me fumbling around, which that was my objective at the first time. <laughs> <laughs> to get them to type for me. But we find a way to get things done. I now have to have um, caregivers 
neighbors come in the home five days a week and my brother and his kids take care of me on the weekend. And, but there's a lot of challenges that make this disease particularly difficult to get through. And I think it should just as hard on the medical community and the caregivers that have to take care of us. But um, I believe one of these days we can find the cause and the cure. And there's where I have hope. And I thank you all from the bottom of my heart because you make this happen. And, and, and you give me hope. And you're touching the lives of many people. I sincerely thank you. Well, I think my, my purpose of being here tonight is uh, Heckman Tillotson has been a corporate sponsor. And we're, we're really proud to be a presenting sponsor again this year for the walk. Uh, we have a very personal reason for doing that, and that is Neil and Suzanne and their family and all that have been associated with them who know uh, what an inspiration Neil has been to this community, so that's already been mentioned. Last year when we were at this event, you might remember that uh, Steve Blast talked, and Steve, stand up and, and uh, let us acknowledge you too. Uh, been a tremendous um, just resource and supporter and advocate for ALS uh, for all of us and, and we really appreciate him but he spoke last year and he talked about Roberto Clemente because we're in the Roberto Clemente Museum and he told the story about him and he talked about him and he said teammate hero friend and when I heard that um, we said you know for all those people that know Neil and sorry about that, but you know, he has been an inspiration and there is nothing that makes you want to do something more than seeing someone that takes something that is so tough and inspires everyone around him and is so selfless. So uh, Heffron Tillotson is really proud to be a sponsor again this year. Uh, this was our shirt last year. I don't know what color we'll have or what saying we'll have, but I can guarantee we'll be out in full force next year. And I hope everyone in this room will be there with us. So thank you very much. Last year I spoke about the fact that we are all in, in business, in some facet of industry, but we're all business people. Here at the chapter, we are in the business of helping people live with ALS. That's, that's um, you know, our sole responsibility in one form or another, whether we're trying to fund research and a cure, trying to advocate to get awareness out, or trying to help people actually live with ALS. Um, I asked everyone to not think of this as a charity and to not think of this as just a sponsorship, but an actual investment. Um, we're all in business together, so let's talk about the investment. Speech devices are not one size fits all, but if somebody could tell the insurance companies, we'd really appreciate it. Um, so what our loan closet is able to do is to provide a loaner speech device to someone to see if it fits to see if it's progressing along with their progression, to see if it's um, meeting all of the needs that they have. If it doesn't, then we'll try a new one. We'll swap it out and figure out what they need. And um, insurance companies don't let you return speech devices and you know exchange them for others. So this is one aspect of your investment that is not, you can't put a price tag on it. Um, so I'd like to introduce you to Babe and Rich. And this is her, um, we did an interview with her about Valentine's Day. And this is Babe and Rich talking about Valentine's Day. She's using a um, head mouse. So um, right here, you can't really see it, but there is a silver dot on her eyeglasses. And you will be able to see that um, she is manipulating the device with the blink of her eyes. Actually, Rich is no different. He has always been there for me in good and bad times. My heart melts when he does all these things for me. Believe it or not, I feel like the luckiest girl in the world. I go to bed every night and thank God for bringing Rich into my life.
Thank you. It's the first I heard that. So as you can see, it's the first he's heard it. It is the way that they are communicating with one another. Um, another thing that I'd like to point out is the head mouse that I told you she's using isn't covered by mo the majority of insurances. We, she has that head mouse because of a loan that we, we gave her. So I'm going to ask you to imagine for a minute being inside your home and not being able to leave it. It's kind of unimaginable of you if you really think about it, but we have some patients where this is an everyday occurrence. They aren't able to leave their home because their wheelchair won't allow it. Our modular wheelchair ramp program built these at a lower cost than actually putting together um, like a wooden or a um, concrete or um, changing the aesthetics of the home. It's able to be put in there. We had a woman who really couldn't leave her home. She had a wheelchair but couldn't go outside. We built this ramp for her and the first thing she did was go down to her neighbor's house and just have a cup of coffee. She just needed that normalcy back in her life of being able to visit with a neighbor and a friend. The, um, and then finally the example I'm going to give you, a power wheelchair. So I don't know if you know, but they started about thirty to $35,000 and they go up from there. And it is completely customizable. They um, take your height, weight, measurements, left-handed, right-handed. They um, take a look at your progression to see if a joystick is needed or perhaps another device, a chin strap to help move the wheelchair on your own. Um, they're really quite expensive, but they can completely change a person's life and give them back their independence. We now have a program together. We're working with a local organization that helps us, or a local company, that helps us refurbish these and um, can get them fitted to somebody for about two to three thousand dollars instead of the thirty thousand dollars that it would cost to get one. When someone goes into a nursing facility, insurance no longer has to provide them with, or no longer covers a power wheelchair. So we had a woman who was put into a nursing facility and she didn't have a way to leave her room. She would have to wait for someone to come and take her to lunch, take her just to get her out of her 20 by 20 space, if, if that large. Um, so we were able to go in, get her measurements, and refurbish a wheelchair that had been generously donated to us and put it back into her hands free of charge, and now she has independence to move around the nursing home at, at her own will. Um, also, we have another person living with ALS who has recently gone on hospice, which um, is, once you do go on hospice, again, insurance no longer covers that. We are just measured her, and she is now going to be able to move about her home again. Um, so these are, this is concrete um, proof or an example of, of what your money did last year and we hope that it will continue on for future years. If you haven't experienced the walk, I highly recommend it. It is, um, it's the one day out of the year. Obviously fundraising is the priority. We're not gonna dance around that. But um, the walk is the, the one day where people aren't alone. They don't feel alone. Um, the community is one. I ask you to imagine being a person living with ALS and driving up to Point State Park and feeling like I'm the only, you know, feeling very alone, feeling like no one else knows what you're going through. And you get out of the car and you see, I really believe, more than 3,400 people walking, but they're all there. The majority of them know the shoes that they're walking in, know your, know your struggles and are there to provide compassion, support, love, and um, together, this is, um, this is the event. It enhances lives, provides support and understanding, but most of all, hope. Um, the, the, the tie in here is that in 1927, when the Yankees came into Pittsburgh to sweep the Pirates in the World Series, the newspaper, there's a newspaper clipping in the Post-Gazette that reads, while the, the, the rest of the Yankees were hobnobbing with the rich of Pittsburgh at the William Penn, Lou Gehrig, humble Lou Gehrig, stuck out the engine house 25 and spent the weekend with his best friend Zip Sloan 
who was a fireman here at the time. He wasn't the chief at that point, but he was second in command. He later becomes the chief of all the city of Pittsburgh. Um, they were roommates in Columbia University. They played minor league baseball together, and Lou gets picked to go to the Yankees, and this guy named Zip Sloan goes to the Tigers, and he was the pitcher. And he blew out his rotator cuff and became came back here to be a fireman. There was no Tom John surgery and, and stuff like that. So he had to become a fireman here in Lawrenceville because we always wondered, Columbia, Columbia grad, baseball player with Luke Garrett, number two on the team, you gotta be a pretty good baseball player. Why is the guy here in Lawrenceville a fireman? And you know, it's like, holy cow, we find out now that we, we Neil and I actually got to meet uh, part of his family. Um, we drove out to Beaver, it took me probably 10 years, I, heard, I found the story in the newspaper, it took years of digging and looking for this Zip Sloan. It turns out that the reason they weren't in the phone book, after I made 100 calls, no one ever heard of the guy, the family in the back of the 60s moved out to Beaver Falls out of our phone book. And so we couldn't find the guy. Well, I'm telling the story on Fox Sports one night and the grandson of this guy calls me and says, hey, that's my grandfather you're talking about. Um, and, you know, I have some photos. And so, you know, I got to go out and, and meet him and get a few photographs. I don't have anything of, that he had with his great grandfather and Lou Garrett yet, but he said he's digging and hopefully with a little luck, we will get those someday. I want to build up a, a little Lou Garrett wing. Um, the two guys are, are, are tied together fairly well as we keep digging. We're finding more and more ways. Um, they both died about the same age, 38, and they both were two of the greatest guys to play the game. I'm not, I'm not saying they're the best two baseball players ever, they're the best two human beings to play the game. Um, they're the only two guys that bypassed the five year waiting list to the Hall of Fame. That's pretty neat. Um, there's three new statues at the, at the Hall of Fame in the entrance, and it's Jackie Robinson flanked by Kalene and Garrett. That's pretty cool. Um, so there's some, some, some decent things to kind of connect the two together. And one that I tell now to people on my tours, that when uh, Roberto died, for some reason, and I guess it's the connection with this guy named Bill Guilfoyle, who was uh, the PR guy for the Pirates, who was from the Yankees, I believe, originally, he calls the Yankees to get permission to read Lou Gehrig's eulogy at Roberto's memorial service. I mean, it was like kind of a, you know, why did that even happen, and who, you know, who would even think to do that, that they did it? And Steve Blast got to read it um, at the memorial service in Puerto Rico in 73. I believe it was January 4th. Um, he actually read it here last year at the event um, and got a little, a little teared up. I mean, you can imagine after 40 years of, you know, not reading that. Um, it, was pretty, it was a pretty awesome moment. You read these type of things and then you read and you listen to this and uh, it's hard not to get choked up. Uh, at the words, is what's said here. But when I'm done reading it, I'm going to sit down. But in reading this, meeting you people, the Alexanders, it's just amazing. You do have so many similarities. And if I had the chance to meet so many people with ALS, I'm sure I would think the same thing of them. For Sandy and I to be able to do this, this is a privilege. It's it's a privilege. Uh, you know, I, I see, Kim, what your company does, and I know that he was a valued employee and somebody that you all loved before this ever happened. But the amazing thing is what people do, the capacity for what people will do when so moved to do something. So I, I think that it's unbelievable. I think, you know, live like Lou, um, it really puts things in perspective uh, when you read this, when you learn a little bit about the person. Uh, to be able to live like Lou or to be able to do the things that you've done, uh, I don't think that you ever, you know, they say about history, sometimes it takes years and years and years of history and sometimes none of us are around to look at the history, but I think you're making history. What you're doing, the way you're approaching this thing, really. Uh, it's amazing. So, uh, before I start to cry, before I read the speech, <laughs> let me attempt to not sound like Lou Gehrig. Be 
because I listened to some of the words the way he said it. And I guess when it's your life, it's um, easier to, to be more human. Fans, for the past two weeks, you have been reading about a bad break I got. Yet today, I consider myself the luckiest man on the face of the earth. I have been in ballparks for 17 years and have never received anything but kindness and encouragement from you fans. Look at these grand men. Which of you wouldn't consider it the highlight of his career just to associate with them for even one day? Sure, I'm lucky. Who wouldn't consider it an honor to have known Jacob Rupert? Also the builder of baseball's greatest empire, Ed Barrow. To have spent six years with that wonderful little fellow, Miller Huggins. <laughs> then to have spent the next nine years with that outstanding leader, that smart student of psychology, the best manager in baseball today, Joe McCarthy. Sure, I'm lucky. When the New York Giants, a team that you would give your right arm to beat and vice versa, sends you a gift, that's something. When everybody down to the groundskeepers and those boys in white coats remember you with trophies, that's something. When you have a wonderful mother-in-law who takes sides with you and squabbles with her own daughter, that's something. Boy, that is something. When you have a father and mother who work all their lives so you can have an education and build your body, it's a blessing. When you have a wife who has been a tower of strength and shown more courage than you dreamed existed, that's the finest I know. So I close in saying that I might have been given a bad break, but I've got an awful lot to live for. That's really special. <laughs> Well, not on the agenda, so why am I here? Uh, I'm here because I like to hang around champions. And uh, I've said this before to several people, that my champions come in three categories. People who teach, people who heal, and people who do things and care about people when they don't have to. And uh, that, that's, that's pretty unique. And you know, the champions, we know. We know the champions over here on the corner of the bench. We know that. But you are all champions also because you don't have to be here. You're here because you care about something and you care about someone. And you know, it's a beautiful spring night. You can be doing a hundred different things, but you care enough to be here. When I leave here tonight, I'm going to get in my car and my heart's going to feel good. And let me tell you something. There's nothing better than having your heart feel good. Your children do something, uh, your friends do something, somebody makes a gesture, and it makes your heart feel good. So I hope that when you get in your car, and I assume you will, because of what you heard tonight, that you will get in your car and drive home, and your heart will feel good. There aren't too many things that are better than that. Uh, I'm here because uh, I'm, I'm inspired. Uh, I've seen a lot of champions. Mike, where's Mike? Right here. What a champion you are. What a champion you are. Uh, so these people, this family, what they do, who they are, they inspire me. And so that's why I'm here tonight. That's why I'm here. Well, that's really what we're here for. We're here to, to um, inspire you and give you the energy and the hope you need to go back and rally around this cause and make no mistake, we're also here to ask for money. Um, and nine times out of ten, people say they don't give because they're not asked. And uh, we are asking. And these are all the reasons why we're asking. 